Welcome to our OpenSIM webinar. My name is Jen Hicks. I'm the OpenSIM project manager, and I'll be serving as the moderator for the webinar today. Today's presenter, Kat Steele, will describe how OpenSIM can be used to understand the mechanics of pathological gait. OpenSIM is a freely available software package for biomechanical simulation that's used by research teams around the world. The first goal of our webinar series is to showcase this cutting-edge research. The speakers will also provide insights on how they used OpenSIM in their research process. With the webinar series, we also hope to provide an easy platform for OpenSIM users to communicate and collaborate since we have a growing and geographically diverse user base. Before we get started, I have a couple of reminders about the webinar format. First, uh, questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation using the Q&A panel. If you need additional technical help, you can also consult the guide on our website. And with that, I'd now like to introduce Kat Steele. Uh, Kat is a graduate student in mechanical engineering here at Stanford University. She's an expert OpenSIM user who's investigating the mechanics of pathological movement patterns in children with cerebral palsy, a topic she's going to discuss this morning. All right, hello everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us. In today's webinar, I'm gonna be discussing some of my recent research results which demonstrate how I've used OpenSIM to explore the dynamics of crouched gait, a common gait pattern in individuals with cerebral palsy. But before we begin, since I cannot see all of you, I'd like to ask you all a few questions to learn more about you and where you come from. So you should now see a series of questions that are gonna be appearing on your screen. If you can answer quickly, and then we'll get to see the results as a group. So the first question is, where do you work? Do you work in academia, hospital, industry or some other realm? So you have a few more seconds to answer and then we'll see the results. Crunching the numbers. Hmm. Well, unfortunately, it looks like our WebEx questions aren't. Oh, okay. right. there it goes. Okay, so it looks like we have a good crowd from academia today with also some hospital and other representatives. All right, so our second question is, what clinical populations do you work with? Do you work primarily with individuals with cerebral palsy, stroke, clubfoot, osteoarthritis, Parkinson's, other, or do you not work with clinical populations? Oh, that's just crunching the numbers. So intensive calculations. <laughs> ah, so it looks like we have a good distribution today. A little bit of everything. All right, and our final question is, what is your experience with OpenSIM? Are you an OpenSIM expert? Have you begun using OpenSIM for some research projects? Have you tried out OpenSIM a few times, maybe downloaded the software from the website, or have you never used OpenSIM? Okay, they should be coming up any second. All right, great. Looks like we have another good distribution. We've got some experts in the crowd as well as some individuals who've never used the software before. So thank you all so much for sharing some information about yourself. It really helps me get an idea of who's out there. So today we are going to be discussing how we can use musculoskeletal modeling and simulation to explore the dynamics of crouch gait. So crouch gait is a common gait pattern in individuals with cerebral palsy. As you can see in this video, it is characterized by excessive hip and knee flexion throughout stance. So why do we care about crouch gait? Well, first of all, as you can imagine watching that video, 
This is an inefficient way to walk and hinders activities of daily life. And unfortunately, we do not have consistent treatment, me treatment methods to help these individuals walk in a more upright gait pattern. There are a wide variety of surgical treatments that have been designed to try and improve hip and knee extension by relieving muscle contractures and bone deformities, which are thought to contribute to crouch gait. Some of the most common surgeries include hamstring lengthening, derotation osteotomy, femoral extension osteotomy, and psoas tenotomy. Unfortunately, outcomes after surgery are variable, and it is difficult to determine which patients will benefit from which surgeries. For example, in a recent study by Hicks et al., they found that in a group of over 200 subjects with crouch gait, that only 48% showed an improvement of more than 10 degrees in knee flexion after orthopedic surgery. Orthopedic surgery can clearly help to improve crouch gait in some individuals, but we need a better method to identify the optimal treatment strategies for each individual. Non-surgical treatment options have also been designed to treat crouch gait, but once again, outcomes are variable. For example, strength training programs have become more popular over the last couple of decades for individuals with cerebral palsy. However, a recent meta-analysis of individuals with crouch gait who completed strength training programs showed that after strength training, some individuals did achieve a more upright posture. However, some subjects also sunk deeper into a crouch. And as you can see in this graph, the results overall were variable. Again, we need a better understanding of the underlying mechanisms of crouch gait to help improve strength training strategies and identify why some subjects improve while others deteriorate with a given treatment regime. So since outcomes are variable, perhaps we should just allow individuals to stay in a crouch gait. However, this is also not a responsible option. Since if left untreated, crouch gait can lead to joint pain, the formation of bone deformities, and potentially the loss of the ability to walk independently. Alpine et al. reported that over 60% of individuals with diaplegic cerebral palsy experienced deterioration in walking function by age 40. And Jansen et al. reported that 41% of adults with diaplegic cerebral palsy suffer from knee pain that limits their walking function. So today I'm gonna to show how musculoskeletal modeling and simulation can be used as another tool in our toolkit to work towards a solution for these dilemmas in the treatment of crouch gait. First, we will use simulations to gain a better understanding of how muscles contribute to motion during crouch gait, how individual muscles help to support the body and propel the body forward during crouch gait. Surgeons commonly target individual muscles or muscle groups, and therefore we need a better understanding of the role of these muscles during crouch gait to understand the effects of surgery. Next, to better understand how strength training may help individuals with crouch gait, we decided to examine a more basic question. An underlying assumption of strength training programs to treat crouch gait is that individuals who walk in a crouch gait do not have sufficient strength to achieve an upright gait pattern. So we asked, how much muscle strength is required to walk in a crouch gait compared to an upright gait pattern? How sensitive is crouch gait to the Finally, to understand why knee pain is common among individuals with cerebral palsy, we examined how the tibial femoral contact force changes during crouch gait compared to unimpaired gait. To investigate these questions, musculoskeletal modeling and simulation provides a useful tool. For these three studies, I generated dynamic musculoskeletal simulations for both typically developing children and children with cerebral palsy. I created simulations of gait for 12 individuals, three typically developing children, and nine children with cerebral palsy who were divided evenly into three groups based upon crouch severity. So we had three children that walked in a mild crouch, three in a moderate, and three in a severe. I obtained motion capture data and ground reaction forces for these children from Gillette Children's Specialty Healthcare. The motion analysis data for the typically developing children was collected as part of a previous research study while the data collected for the children with cerebral palsy was part of normal clinical care. All subjects walked barefoot at their self-selected speed. On the right, you can see the average knee flexion curves for the four groups over one gait cycle. The dotted line is knee flexion angle during normal gait. And as you can see, knee flexion increases for the mild, moderate, and severe crouch gait groups. 
The severe crouch gait group had an average knee flexion angle between 70 and 80 degrees during stance, so quite severe. To explore these three different research questions, I used a similar simulation process to create the musculoskeletal simulations of gait. This process is outlined on this slide. So for each subject, I started with a generic musculoskeletal model with 92 musculotendon actuators and 19 degrees of freedom, which was scaled according to anthropometric measurements to each of the subjects. I also scaled the maximum isometric force of all the muscles in the model by height squared. Next, I determined the subject's joint angles using inverse kinematics, which determines the set of joint angles, which minimizes the error between experimentally measured markers and virtual markers placed on the model during scaling. In the next step, called the residual reduction algorithm, we solve for a set of joint torques that will drive the model and track the motion determined with inverse kinematics. However, due to experimental errors and modeling assumptions, Measured ground reaction forces and moments are not dynamically consistent with the model kinematics. That's when we solve the dynamic equation, an extra force and moment termed residual, represented by this orange arrow, is applied to the pelvis segment. These residuals are non-physical forces, so the goal of the residual, residual reduction algorithm is to minimize these forces by slightly altering the parameters we know have error such as joint angles and the location of the torso mass center and the total mass of the model. Now the final step is to determine the muscle forces that will recreate the subject's motion. The musculoskeletal system is complex and redundant, so we need to determine how to distribute the forces across the many muscles available. There are several methods that can be used to solve this problem. The first and probably the most common is static optimization. In static optimization, at each time step, a set of muscle activations is determined, which will recreate the joint torques at that moment in time while minimizing a given objective function. An objective function that is commonly used is minimizing activation squared. Computed muscle control is another method available in OpenSim, which integrates forward in time and thus is able to take into account temporal effects such as the activation and deactivation dynamics of muscle and tendon dynamics. CMC determines a set of muscle excitations, which will drive the model according to the subject's kinematics over time. Computed muscle control also minimizes an objective function, like static optimization, to solve the redundancy problem of having more actuators or muscles than degrees of freedom. There are advantages and disadvantages to both of these methods and it depends upon what type of research question you are trying to answer, which will be most appropriate. Whichever method is used, at the end of this process, we have a predicted set of muscle force for each subject's motion. So that is an overview of the process used to create a dynamic simulation. We completed this process for all 12 subjects. This process and all other methods I'll discuss today were completed using OpenSim. Scaling, inverse kinematics, the residual reduction algorithm, static optimization, and computed muscle control are all built-in tools available in OpenSim. All right, so now let's look at our first question. How do individual muscles support the body and propel the body forward during crouch gait? So for this study, in addition to determining a set of muscle forces that will drive the model according to each subject's motion, we also need to determine how much muscles contribute to motion. To do this, I used an induced acceleration analysis in OpenSim. This analysis calculates a muscle's potential by solving the system's equations of motion and the constraint equation. A muscle's potential is defined as the ability of a muscle to generate acceleration per unit force. So for this study, we were interested in how each muscle contributed to acceleration of the mass center upward, or contributing to support, or forward, or contributing to progression. To determine the contributions of each muscle, we then multiplied the potential of each muscle by the muscle force estimated from computed muscle control to get the overall contribution to acceleration. 
We can repeat this process at each time step through the simulation to determine the contribution of each muscle to motion throughout the gait cycle. The induced acceleration analysis is available in OpenSim under the Analyze tool. As you can see in this screen capture, you can add the induced acceleration analysis by clicking the Add in the Analysis tab of the Analyze tool. All right, so now let's look at some of our first results. So first we wanted to determine how much muscle, how we wanted to determine which muscles support the mass center during crouch gait. So if we start by looking at normal, unimpaired walking, we find that the muscles that have the largest average upward acceleration of the mass center during stance are the ankle plantar flexors, the gastrocnemius, soleus, the vasti, and the gluteus medius. These plots show the average contribution of each muscle during the stance phase of gait for the three subjects in each group to accelerating the mass center upward or contributing to support of the mass center. Now, if we look at mild crouch gait, we find that the same muscles are working to support the mass center. The only sig significant differences are a slight increase in the contribution from soleus and a decrease in the contribution from the gluteus medius. For moderate and severe crouch gait, we find that the contribution of the gastrocnemius to support, which remember has a knee flexion moment arm, decreases significantly, while the contribution of the vasti to support increases dramatically. From these results, it appears that a large proportion of the responsibility to support the mass center has transferred from the gastrocnemia to the quadriceps. Also, like mild crouch gait, the contribution of the, gluteus, of the gluteus medius to support is reduced. Next, we wanted to determine which muscles are propelling the mass center forward. Once again, looking at the average contribution to forward acceleration during the stance phase and starting with unimpaired gait, the largest contributors to forward progression are the gastrocnemius, the biarticular hamstring, the soleus, and the iliopsoas. Looking at crouch gait, we find that the mild, moderate, and severe crouch gait, the contributions of the gastrocnemius and biarticular hamstrings remain similar. However, the contribution from the uniarticular soleus muscle increases dramatically. Also, the contribution from the iliopsoas to forward progression decreases with crouch severity. So, so, so far, we have been examining the average contribution of muscles over the stance phase of gait. However, how muscles contribute throughout stance also has some interesting changes. So, these plots show how the vasti on the top and the gastrocnemius on the bottom contribute to mass and our acceleration at each 2% of the gait cycle. You can think of each line as an arrow pointing the, in the direction, up or down, forward or backward, that the muscle is accelerating the mass center. During unimpaired gait, the vasti are accelerating the mass center up and backward during the early stance, and then decrease in activity during late stance. The gastrocnemius ramp up during terminal stance to support and accelerate the mass center upward and forward. If we bring up mild, moderate, and severe crouch gait, we find that these profiles change quite significantly. During crouch gait, more sustained contributions are required throughout stance from both the vasti and gastroc to support the mass center. However, as we saw earlier, the contribution of the gastrocnemius to support decreases but the contribution of the vasti to support increases dramatically during moderate and severe crouch gait. This is due to the reduced passive skeletal support of a crouch posture and the increased knee flexion moment due to gravity in a crouch posture. The sustained contribution of the vasti to support required during crouch gait, however, also increases the backward acceleration from the vasti. So although the vasti are important in supporting the mass center during crouch gait, their increased activity level can also hinder forward progression. This increased backward acceleration is also likely why we saw the increase in soleus's contribution to forward progression to compensate for the vasti's increased backward acceleration. All right, so now we have examined how individual muscles contribute to motion of the mass center during crouch gait. We saw that crouch gait uses similar muscles to support and propel the body forward, but requires sustained contributions throughout stance to support the mass center 
which likely accounts for the increased energy costs required to walk in a crouch gait. We also saw which muscles were critical to supporting and propelling the mass center forward, two tasks that need to be maintained after any surgical intervention. Now we will turn to our second research question. How much muscle strength is required to walk in a crouch gait? And how sensitive is crouch gait to weakness of individual muscle groups compared to unimpaired gait? For this study, we developed a weakness protocol to test how sensitive each subject's motion was to weakness of individual muscle groups. In this weakness protocol, we re-ran computed muscle control while reducing the maximum isometric force of individual muscles until we found the point at which the model could no longer recreate the subject's motion. So for example, for each muscle, we started with the full unimpaired muscle strength and then iteratively weakened the muscle by searching through the space until we found the point at which, if the muscle was weakened further, the model could no longer recreate the subject's motion. We termed this point the minimum required muscle strength, which was expressed as a percent of the original maximum force. We repeated this process for seven different muscle groups, including the gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, ilius psoas, biarticular hamstring, quadriceps, plantar flexors, and anterior tibialis. So now let's look at some results. So this graph shows the average minimum required strength for each muscle group. A value close to zero on this chart means that the muscle group could be nearly removed from the model and other muscles were able to compensate and maintain the subject's motion. Likewise, a value close to 100 would indicate that the motion was very sensitive to weakness of that muscle. The unimpaired subjects are the white bars, and then mild, moderate, and severe crouch gait groups are in progressively darker shades of red. So first you will notice that all of the, these muscle groups could be weakened quite substantially, indicating that walking does not require near your full strength, which makes sense, and also that by having a redundant muscular system, our body is good at compensating for weakness of individual muscle groups. Some muscle groups, such as the gluteus maximus and anterior tibialis, could be nearly completely removed from the model. Crouch gait did require slightly more gluteus maximus strength due to larger hip extensor moments during stance. Severe crouch gait also required more anterior tibialis force due to the large ankle dorsiflexion angles. In addition to requiring more hip extensor strength, crouch gait also required, as expected, more knee extensor strength. Here you can see that the amount of quadriceps strength required increased with crouch severity. Looking in more detail, here I am showing the minimum required quadriceps strength of each subject with their minimum knee flexion angle during stance on the x-axis and the minimum required quadriceps strength on the y-axis. The amount of quadriceps strength required increased quadratically with crouch severity. Thus, so far we have seen that crouch gait places a higher demand on the hip and knee extensors than unimpaired gait. In contrast, crouch gait requires significantly less gluteus medius strength, primarily due to a reduced hip abductor moment during stance. Additionally, mild and moderate crouch gait require less plantar flexor strength than unimpaired gait due to a reduced ankle plantar flexor moment during terminal stance. However, severe crouch gait requires similar plantar flexor strength as unimpaired gait, mainly due to a large sustained ankle plantar flexor moment throughout stance. So in summary, these results demonstrate that crouch gait requires more hip and knee extensor strength than unimpaired gait, suggesting that the individuals who walk in a crouch gait could have sufficient strength in these muscle groups to walk in an upright posture. In contrast, crouch gait requires less hip abductor strength, and mild and moderate crouch gait required less ankle plantar flexor strength. Since crouch gait places a reduced demand on these muscle groups, crouch gait could be a compensation for weakness of these muscle groups. Future studies that examine if strengthening these muscle groups would lead to more consistent improvements in crouch gait would be an interesting area of study. Okay, so moving to our final question. Now we are going to look at potential causes or mechanisms of pain in individuals with cerebral palsy by examining how the contact force between the tibia and femur changes with crouch severity. As we discussed earlier, we know that the quadriceps force increases significantly with crouch severity. 
Since muscle forces are the primary contributors to joint reaction forces, we were interested in determining how the knee contact force during crouch gait changed with crouch severity. For this study, since we were primarily interested in muscle force distribution at each time step, we used static optimization. The resulting forces were summed with the intersegmental forces using OpenSIM's joint reaction analysis to calculate the contact force between the tibia and the femur. Additionally, to compare to experimental data, we also created a simulation of a subject with an instrumented total knee replacement. Static optimization minimized an objective function, which summed the activation of each muscle squared multiplied by a constant with a default value of one. The simulation of the subject with the instrumented total knee replacement was used to set the value of these constants. We performed an optimization to determine the minimum set of constants that resulted in a difference between the estimated contact force and the experimental contact force that was less than 10% of body weight. The resulting set of constants was seven for the gastroc and three for the hamstrings and one for all other muscles. This figure shows the resulting comparison between the estimated tibial femoral force in black and the experimental data in gray from the instrumented total knee replacement of the subject. Once we had determined the constants from the instrumented total knee replacement, we then estimated the joint contact force using the same method for all of our crouch gait subjects and the three typically developing children. I also wanna point out, similar to the induced acceleration analysis, that the joint reaction analysis is available in OpenSIM under the Analyze tool. On the right, you can see the joint reaction analysis highlighted under the list of analyses available in OpenSIM. So let's look at the results. So for the unimpaired subjects, we see that the typically we see the typical double bump pattern of knee contact force, similar to previous publications. Now, if we look at mild crouch gait, we see that the forces are similar in magnitude, with a slightly reduced peak in terminal stance largely due to less ankle plantar flexor push-offs during crouch gait. However, if we look at moderate and severe crouch gait, we find that the knee contact force increases significantly. The maximum knee contact force during severe crouch gait was six times body weight, almost three times the force during unimpaired gait. These increases are largely due to increases in the quadriceps demand. If we look at the change in quadriceps force for mild, moderate, and severe crouch gait, we see a parallel increase with crouch severity, with a minimal increase for mild crouch gait, but significant increases for moderate and severe crouch gait. Looking in more detail, similar to the results we saw during the strength study, we see that both the average quadriceps force required during stance, shown in gray, and hence the average knee contact force during stance, shown in red, increase quadratically with crouch severity. Each Point in the plot represents one of the subjects with their average knee flexion angle during stance on the x-axis and their average knee contact force and, um, and average intercept force during stance on the y-axis. To both knee contact force and quadriceps demand within one standard deviation of normal would require an average knee flexion angle during stance of less than 25 degrees. These results suggest that increased tibiofemoral force could be a contributor to knee pain later in life, and, such, and suggest that achieving a more upright posture not only reduces the demand on the quadriceps, but also could prevent joint damage or deterioration. All right, so that finishes off the third study that we're discussing today. In all of these studies, of course, there are limitations, and I'd like to emphasize that musculoskeletal modeling and simulation is an additional tool for our toolkit and is a valuable complement to experimental and clinical studies. It is good for helping us to develop and test hypotheses, measure quantities that we can't measure experimentally, and develop new treatment strategies. Some of the limitations of this study include that we currently assume normal muscle properties and distributions. However, in individuals with cerebral palsy, spasticity and contraction are common, and the strength distribution is often altered, for example, with weaker distal muscles. In the future, we need a better quantitative understanding of how muscle physiology changes in individuals with cerebral palsy to improve our understanding of the underlying mechanisms of gait pathology in cerebral palsy. Additionally, simulations are difficult to validate. 
We have some tools such as comparing to electromyography or instrumented total joint replacement. These are not always available and do not provide a direct means of comparing to these quantities, to the quantities we are interested in. In this future, we will need more tools and strategies for validating simulations. But also, this emphasizes the necessary partnership with experimental and clinical studies that are required. Despite these limitations, these studies have shown consistent results and interesting trends that can help us to better understand the underlying mechanisms and potential contributors to crash gait. We have examined how muscles are contributing to motion, how sensitive the system is to weakness of individual muscle groups, and how joint load gene changes with crash severity. Future studies will explore experimentally the hypothesis developed using these simulations and incorporate more subject specific parameters to better understand complex phenomena such as spasticity. With that, I'd like to thank my colleagues and funding sources, in particular Mike Schwartz from Gillette Children's Specialty Healthcare, Marilyn Vanderkrow from the New University Medical Center, and our team here at Stanford in the Neuromuscular Biomechanics Laboratory. And I'll take any questions that you have and look forward to future discussions and collaborations. So thank you all. All right, thanks, Kat, for a great talk. Before we get started on the open question and answer session, I have a couple quick announcements to remind you. Uh, first, please fill out the survey that's going to appear in a pop-up window when you exit the event. This will help us improve future webinars. Uh, also, we'll be making a recording of this webinar that will be available um, this week on our website later this week. Uh, open Sim and this webinar series are supported by several grants from the NIH and the European Union, including an NIH grant that funds our National Center for Simulation and Rehabilitation Research. Uh, information about the center, upcoming events, and other resources for the OpenSIM community are also available on our website. Uh, now let's get started with the question and answer session. All the questions will be text-based. You need to go to the Q&A box on the bottom right of your screen type in your question, and make sure you select to ask all panelists. You need to select ask all panelists or we won't see your question. Uh, and now we'll get to as many questions as we can. All right, so while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I'll ask a question. So in your model, I don't believe you included a model of spasticity. Uh, how do you think this might affect your conclusions given uh, results of some of your studies? Sure. So, spasticity is common in individuals with cerebral palsy. Uh, it's a velocity dependent resistance to stretch. So, if I was to passively move an individual who had spasticity, move their arm or their leg, you would actually feel some resistance with increasing velocity. So, we're currently getting slightly more quantitative understandings of how spasticity changes, what it's sensitive to um, from some of our clinical partners. And we actually have a visiting scholar here this summer who is working on developing a muscle model for spasticity. So that should be exciting. Uh, also, as in terms of how it would affect our results, when we were ta talking earlier about muscle potentials, a muscle's potential would not be sensitive to something such as contracture or spasticity. However, the contribution or when we multiply the potential times muscle force could be slightly changed if spasticity causes one muscle to be more active than it otherwise might have been. So for example, uh, the relative distribution of muscle contribution may change, but the direction that individual muscles are accelerating the mass in our, our individual joints wouldn't be affected by spasticity. Okay, next we have a question from Patrick Riley. Uh, how did you scale um, how did you, what the question is, how did you scale maximum muscle force? Yeah, so as you know, most of our models come from adult data. And so since I'm working with children, the method that I most typically use to scale the maximum isometric force of the muscles in the model is to scale by height squared. I've tried many different scaling regimes and it actually doesn't affect the results too much. Um, but why we choose to scale by height squared is that we know that uh, muscle force is proportional to physiological cross-sectional area of the muscles, so a dimension of length squared. And we also know that height 
has been shown to be one of the best predictors of limb length and also physiological cross-sectional areas generically across the population. So for now, in order to make sure that our child models don't have adult level muscle strength, we scale by maximum isometric or by height squared for all the maximum isometric force in the model. But this is something that we can change easily and um, test the sensitivity of, which is something we do regularly. Okay, now we have two related questions about how you use EMG in generating your simulation. Uh, so John, John Chow asks, will surface EMG data increase, increase the fidelity of the dynamic simulation? And Saren Kaya, apologies for the pronunciation, asks, is there any relationship between muscle forces and EMG data? All right, so first of all, for the first one, we currently use EMG as to compare the results of our simulation. <laughs> so we currently will get from our clinical centers EMG data for a limited number of models, and we use that to compare our simulations. I think in some of these backup slides, yeah. So for example, here I show some of our, in gray, is the EM, average EMG data for the three subjects in each category. So it's the unimpaired subject, mild, moderate, and severe. And then you can also see the um, activation of the muscles um, plotted in black. So we do these comparisons to try and get a good idea of how well our simulation is actually reflecting the individual subject activity. So unfortunately, we don't get EMG from all subjects. It's a limitation of using clinical data. Um, but this at least gives us a point of comparison. And if you want to an open system, you can also actually constrain your muscle activation to EMG if you are very confident in your EMG or if you have them from a large number of muscles. Um, as for the second question, there is not a direct relationship between muscle force and EMG data. Since muscle force is dependent upon the length, the velocity, and when you, especially when you're using surface EMG, the muscle itself is often moving with respect to the surface electrodes. And so although you'll generally, there's a general trend of increasing EMG amplitude with increasing muscle force, there is no direct relationship between muscle force and EMG. Okay, one more EMG related question from Renata Van Zandt. Uh So how many muscles were in the model and how many did you collect EMG for those muscles and uh, or were there some that you were missing and how did you account for all of that? All right, so there's a total of 92 muscular tendon um, actuators in the model, um, but you have to remember that some muscles, such as the gluteus medius and gluteus maximus, since they're large pennate muscles, are actually represented by more than one um, muscular tendon actuator in the model so that we can better model their architecture. So the total number of muscles in the traditional sense is 36 per leg. And of course, we do not have EMG for all those muscles. We'd love someday if there would be an easy way of especially getting some of those deeper mu uh, muscles. But for now, we do with what we have, and hopefully continued development in the future will give us better EMG data to compare our results to. OK. Uh, next, a question from Allison Arnold. Uh, can you clarify how the muscle forces were scaled? Why scale by height squared? Uh, does this give you a different CMC solution than if you do not scale peak force capacity? Um, so basically, so if we don't scale by peak force capacity, we actually get a pretty uh, similar CMC solution, but just the activation levels that you see are lower. So for instance, we'd see in our model an activation level of about 0.2, while if we hadn't have scaled the model, you'd get some very small activation levels just because these children have a much smaller maximum isometric force than normal. So in terms of the actual distribution and results we get from computed muscle control, it doesn't vary that much. But we just want to also be making sure that our subjects aren't generating any wild out of the ballpark muscle forces that someone of their size would not be able to produce. Okay, and then one more question um, from Allison. Uh, in your strength study, was 100% strength different for all subjects? Yeah, so that 100% strength was that value scaled by height squared. So whatever their maximum isometric force was after scaling by height squared is the what was considered the 100% for each subject, since our subjects did vary a bit in height uh, and age. 
Okay, so next from Alisa Schrenk, uh, what is the criteria to define when the simulation failed when you reduced the max isometric force? Uh, so in our, in our models, we include reserve actuators, which are basically idealized torque actuators at each of the degrees of freedom. And generally these actuators are off. But when the system or the model can no longer track the motion with the muscle, it will activate these reserve actuators. So our cutoff was when these reserve actuators um, either came on or when the, the model failed to track the motion with less than um, two degrees of error. But it was generally the reserve actuators turning on, which was the criterion which we met. <clears throat> Okay, uh, a question from Babak Beji. Again, I'm sorry for the pronunciation. Uh, have you done any studies related to the changes in muscle forces uh, when patients are using orthotics like ankle, foot, or toes? I have not. I think it's an interesting area of study and would definitely change some of our results. Uh, I have seen some individuals who have tried importing uh, AFOs into the model or prosthetics into the model and then modeling either some additional passive tension to try and model the AFO, but I personally have not, but I think it would be an interesting area of future study. Okay, next from Chandra Sekhan Jayaraman, um, what type of model did you use for your muscle? So was it a hill type muscle model? Can you talk a little more mm -hmm. about that? So it is a hill type muscle model. Um, we use the Thalen muscle model, which is incorporated in OpenSim. Uh, OpenSim offers several different muscle models that you can choose from, but we generally, that's the one we generally use. But they're all, all of them at their base have a hill type muscle model as their kind of foundation. And you can also build your own muscle models um, using the OpenSim API. Okay. Um, Next, a question from Giordano Valente. Uh, what is the influence of assuming optimal neuromotor control in the optimization problem since you're working with neurologically impaired subjects? Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the reasons why comparing, for instance, EMG is important. So actually, when I first was starting these studies, I thought that the results that we were going to get from our simulation when we're minimizing an objective function such as activation squared, that we would see big differences and we wouldn't see all the co-activation and overactivity that we commonly characterize in individuals with cerebral palsy. However, I've actually been surprised by um, the fact that we do see these co-activation and overactivity patterns just based upon the, uh, the gait pattern that these individuals are using, which might mean that some of the things we usually attribute to altered neuromuscular control are actually more a function of the gait pattern itself than the control. Having said that, I definitely think there's room for us to improve and there's ways for us to develop our own controllers or change the optimization algorithm um, in order to uh, explore this more in the future. So for example, they've recently developed a new tool where you can um, use Simulink in MATLAB to create your own controllers. And I think, especially in individuals with cerebral palsy, when we start thinking about factors such as plasticity or just decreased neural drive, that these controllers could give us even more insight in the future into how their gait patterns are different and how they're controlling their movement. Okay, I think we have time for one or two more questions. So if you have any remaining questions, go ahead and uh, type them in now. Uh, so, Christopher Matthew has a more general question. So he's a brand new OpenSim user. How would, in your experience, what, um, you know, you were once, you weren't <laughs> always an OpenSim expert. Uh, how would you recommend getting started um, in terms of tutorials, jumping right in? Yeah. What, what do you so the best way to start using OpenSim is just to jump in, try it out, and the more you use it, the more you learn. But there are some really great resources to help you get started. So. On the OpenSim website, the same place where you registered for the webinar, you can find a link to where you can actually go and download OpenSim. And I just encourage you to do that. It's free and really quick and easy. Um, then there's also a set of free tutorials that are a good introduction to 
how you get a model into OSM, how you can calculate muscular tendon lengths and velocities, uh, how you can import motion data. And so that's a really good starting point for learning the basics of the OpenSim GUI and getting yourself oriented. After that, I think the next best step is to try and getting some of your data yourself. Because at the end of the day, you'll probably want to be using some of your own data. And so uh, the OpenSim user's guide, which is also on the website, and there's also the OpenSim developer's guide, which is for if you have more advanced things that you want to implement, are really good at stepping you through the process of getting your data in, scaling your model, inverse kinematics, and kind of stepping through these different steps and learning about the different pros and cons of different methods. Uh, there's also open sim workshops hosted here at Stanford. I think twice a year the information is on the website. And so I highly recommend those to help you get a jump start on your research. And I'm sure I forgot something. And also you can just explore simtk.org, which is where you download the software from. You can see, search the project, make a project of your own and see how other people have been using OpenSim. You can download other people's models. There's multiple lower extremity models, upper extremity models, and neck model that you can download and go oh, new lumbar model that you can download and use uh, in OpenSim. Okay, thanks, Cass. <laughs> One other thing is that we also have a great uh, user discussion forum where people ask questions and members of the OpenSim community or people who are at Stanford answer those questions. And you can find uh, links to all of this, as Pat mentioned, on our website at opensim.stanford.edu. And you should be directed there at the end of this webinar as well. Um, OK, we have another uh, research-related question now from Stacey Acker. Uh, you found up to six times body weight in the joint contact force for a severe crouch gait. Is there any instrumented tibia data at the same average function angle that would help to determine if this high contact force is acceptable or reasonable? Um, so as of two months ago, there wasn't. But luckily, we were able to get some instrumented total knee replacement subjects in uh, to our lab here at Stanford and have them walk in crouch gait. Unfortunately, since they're generally individuals in their 70s, 80s, we weren't able to get them to walk in a severe crouch gait. We were only able to get to about a moderate crouch gait to maintain the comfort level. But we're currently analyzing those results, processing those results. So look for them soon in the future. All right. Uh, I think those are all of the questions that we have uh, for this morning. So, oh, can we get to the? All right. Um, so, thank you for all of the great questions and the great discussion. In closing, again, I ask that you complete the informational survey that's going to appear in a pop-up window at the conclusion uh, when you leave the event. Uh, this will help us improve webinars and choose some upcoming topics. Again, thank you all for participating, and we hope you'll continue to stay involved with OpenSIM.